I think this movie is the only Austin adaptation that really captures Austin's brilliant humor and wit. Mm. Like every other adaptation I've seen is certainly funny because there are funny characters with funny lines. But Jane Austen's writing is so, in many ways, it's almost dry and like very clever and really smart. And I don't think that comes across in a lot of adaptations. I mean, I said the the 2005 Pride and Prejudice isn't trying to do that at all. It's leaning into the romanticism, Mm -hmm. which it has its own merits and I love. But this is just like, it's almost overdoing it. But again, I think that works for the sensibilities of the 21st century audience. I was going to say that this feels overdone in a good way where yeah. every shot feels staged. Every line of dialogue is intentional or mm-hmm. funny. Mm-hmm. Like there is no fat on this movie in the look of it, in the locations, the mm-hmm. costumes or the dialogue. Mm-hmm. There are quick shots and constant cuts. Like if you watch a conversation take place in this movie, there are a thousand cuts back and forth between the two actors. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah. you know, three or however many are talking. Yeah. But it's almost on every line, which makes you feel really invested in each person's performance. Yes. But it also, I don't know, it's like it's moving at a certain clip that you have to, you have to meet the movie where it is. It's not yeah. dumbing itself down. It's got no. almost like that YouTube pacing. This is a really modern adaptation of Austin. But just like I, I mean, in many ways, the the 2005 Pride and Prejudice, I, we talked about in that episode, that movie is very much of its time. It is speaking to the 2005 American audience and I think this one in the same way is speaking to the 2020 modern American audience but both of them are still effectively capturing the mood of the book for the correct audience just in really different ways and even even when you do get wide shots of a conversation I mean most of this movie is conversation that's all uh, all Jane Austen is is conversations yeah Uh but it's all the most gorgeous rooms you've ever seen but shot in Mm -hmm. such an interesting way where it's Mm -hmm. not that palatial kind of lush beauty you get in the 2005 right it's extremely symmetrical shots of rooms right the characters are perfectly centered mm-hmm. everything feels staged but not in a false way no it's like staged in the way that all social interactions for the gentility in the early 19th century are staged i noticed that particularly with the color palettes mm-hmm. because they're, the they're so good. shifting constantly mm-hmm. but every single combination is striking it's it's yeah. this wonderful tonal kaleidoscope you get through this movie Mm -hmm. even in the main house and i don't know how many locations they use to sort of construct that location of a house you mean emma's house yeah there's there's the green wall blue wall Mm -hmm. pink wall depending on the room all with that really bold white molding cutting it up yeah mm -hmm. and this director was previously mostly known for music videos and i Mm. think that really intricate composition comes off here counting up the colors around certain scenes Mm -hmm. there was like a fullness of the spectrum after you see so many scenes filling out the rainbow like that there's almost a fullness of story yeah where it feels like the movie has such a tight hold on what's happening Mm -hmm. because everything is so much in its control because everyone's working so hard yeah there's like this wrapped focus every character has clear motivations Mm -hmm. the plot is always moving it all comes together as this impressive like relentless juggernaut I mean, it's really relaxing and quippy and light to watch, Mm -hmm. but it reminds me a lot in its composition of Mad Max Fury Road. (laughs) I see what you mean. It's like this fresh riff on a really well-known genre and structure by just putting an ungodly amount of work into every single moment and shot, even with the centering and the composition. Well, yeah, I mean, like every scene that's happening, it's so essential to the plot, even though it's just like... A conversation between two people in a drawing room or a, a quick stroll about the garden like it's never like you know big chase scenes obviously right. it's not it's not a dramatic movie in that way but every social interaction is so essential and it moves the plot forward and or it moves the characters forward in a really significant way and so every scene that happens is essential you can't cut anything out because it's so essential to the overall story so it's it's capturing the drama and the absurdity of the drama of these like from an outside perspective meaningless interactions and it's, and class is so important mm-hmm. in these stories like it's important always but especially like in a story like this sure. where when you're talking about like the gentility like these higher class individuals whose only problems are who's gonna marry who and yeah. what am i gonna have at tea right you know and the only uh, area where it deviates from that a bit is Harriet and the character of Harriet, her mm-hmm. birth 
that's not being known very well, what class does she fall into? How can she avoid sinking, you know, lower on the social scale? What are the implications of her marrying a farmer? He's like not low enough for it to be like a sweet thing, but he's not high enough for Mm -hmm. it to be impressive. And so it deals with that a bit. But for the most part, it's like none of this stuff really matters. None of these people have to work because they're all just old money. And so from an outside perspective, you would think, I don't care about these people and they're you know, poor little rich people, me, but the, the, the way that it's done is like you, you end up caring so much and it's because it's almost self-aware and making fun of itself. Yes. In that yes. Way. The thing that gets you invested in the problems that you would otherwise mock or sort of have just a detachment or disdain for mm-hmm. is the humor. That's what gets you in the door. Yes. And those characters who are more highbrow, those were the ones who caught my attention for almost the whole thing Mm -hmm. because it's unmistakably those actors be it emma her father mr elton the Mm -hmm. priest oh i love mr elton he's so funny they're all unmistakably having a great time yeah like they're funny goofy pointed there's such a taut humor to it Mm -hmm. that is crossed with like you were talking about kind of the performative misery and dread over these meaningless uh, like luxury yeah. problems. Well, and you can see them all kind of hating it, like the characters. Like my one of my favorite scenes is when they're all at that picnic on that hill when Emma has that, she says that really nasty thing to Miss Bates and there's a mm-hmm. really awkward moment. Before the lead up to that, like you understand how it happens. They're all sitting around. It's uncomfortable because everybody's wearing 45 layers yeah. and, you know, stays and thick cravats and like no one's comfortable. They're all sitting on this hill trying to have like a nice picturesque little picnic by the seaside but no one knows what to talk about everyone's kind of hot and uncomfortable no one's really has much mm-hmm. to say and so you know mr churchill and emma are like kind of flirting and like trying to figure out what to do and so emma's just trying to play mr churchill's game of making fun of everybody like because that's kind of the language he's speaking and she's just trying to do something and have a conversation and she likes to feel above everybody but you can see the misery that everybody's feeling of like trying to search for a conversation topic and that's something which i love about jane austen is that's so translatable and relatable even though i'm not in the regency times gentility i still have been in a situation like that and i can understand it right and that's also such a crux of the movie because that's the breaking point where the main character's yeah. trick stops working and they stop right. having this like death grip control over everyone. Right. I mean, it's it's a Richard the Third thing. Mm-hmm. That happens with him where he thinks he's still playing the game and outfoxing everyone and every other character in the scene is like, oh, look at this pathetic dork. <laughs> yeah. He's uh-huh. been doing this to us the whole time and yeah. he's the only one who doesn't know that it's over. Mm-hmm. The What you're talking about with that moment of kind of an emperor has no clothes thing, mm. that is set up like that House of Cards moment is set up from the very first shot of this movie, Mm. which is this absolutely obscene, gorgeous privilege that these people have (laughs) where she's walking into this uh, little greenhouse and someone's holding a lantern on a stick like right above her. So it's hanging perfectly in the shot. And someone's following after her, clipping the flowers that she wants to clip for the bouquet for um, Miss Taylor. There's great, quick funny really memorable characterization in this Mm -hmm. and that's true of every role not just the lead here and that's sort of the other trick here i think is that every role is meaty Mm -hmm. every actor feels engaged but they also all have like relevant arcs to the overall structure of the movie i know she's so good at characters and making them all interesting because it's not just like okay here's our main person everyone else is a side character even the side characters have their own arcs Mm -hmm. and you're interested in them even if you hate them or they're weird or annoying or creepy there's something intriguing yeah whether if it's goofy if it's attractive or if it's really Mm -hmm. off-putting or silly like there's there's some hook to Mm -hmm. every character where it feels like on their own they would each steal the show from another like classic literature yes. adaptation like i would watch a whole movie about mr elton or yes. i'd watch a whole movie about harriet the movie feels like a collection of character actors mm-hmm. in great great side roles i mean i would read a, i would watch a movie about mr martin who doesn't have a single line right. of dialogue in this movie versus <laughs> what i think is more typical now like look at game of thrones that's an ensemble of protagonists right yeah like there's still a clear like emma is our main character harriet's the best friend the main love interest is mr knightley also all kind of passive side characters right there's no one person steering the narrative even emma she starts thinking she's this matchmaker but 
Mm-hmm. By the time you're half an hour in, you see that there are a thousand other currents moving this ocean of people. Yeah, And right. that she's not in charge. Mm-hmm. So they all kind of get like moments in the spotlight. Yeah. I, I mean, she's obviously the lead actor. Yeah. But it really is split between everyone. Right, yeah. I, I think that's the reason I love Jane Austen's book so much. It's a reason. is because it's her books are basically just big character studies and I don't think this is something I had articulated to myself until recently but I love character focused books and stories like if I don't really have an investment in the characters I don't at all care what's going on no matter how exciting or dramatic is mm-hmm. if the characters aren't connecting with me then I don't care and her characters ooh, her characters are so easy to connect to even if it's Mr. Eldon, who's a complete ridiculous asshole, or Harriet, who I don't really have much in common with, or Mr. Woodhouse, Emma's dad, mm-hmm. who is just like this old, you know, silly, sweet man who I don't have much in common with. I'm still connecting to all of them. I think uh, what she's so good at is that she can do character portraits that aren't of one person. Mm-hmm. Because when you say character study in a modern sense, People think of Taxi Driver or Joker, mm-hmm. I guess, even more modern, mm-hmm. where it's basically one character. Yeah. It's like an hour and a half and it moves kind of slowly. It's usually sad and it's kind of a drag with like one really intense kind of Jake Gyllenhaal <laughs> performance at For the sure. middle of it. Sure. And her trick, I think here, which is essential and really refreshing now, is that that everything pays off so much quicker than you're expecting it to. Mm. There's really strong hype and setup for events and drama, and then it just pays off way too quickly. Mm. Like the the first time Harriet is proposed to, or mm. this big drama at dinner, mm-hmm. and then you think it's building to more and more like emotional crescendos, and someone mentions that it's snowing, and everyone leaves, <laughs> yeah. and the dinner is over. Yeah, uh-huh. like. It's a shock reveal, but it's not like a stereotypical plot twist. It's, right. it's, it's a signal to the audience that the story's moving faster than you, you can think ahead. Right. It, it, it's sort of, it's the antidote to, to kind of spoiler culture. Yeah. Where there's a balanced pace. It's not all racing ahead. Mm. The movie does slow down, but the only slowdowns you get for the first hour of the movie are really intense character moments. Mm-hmm. And by the time, I, I mean, the movie's two hours and like four minutes. Mm-hmm. I looked at the, the, the timer like an hour and a half in, and the movie it was moving at a much slower clip, mm-hmm. but that was a... I didn't even notice because at that point I was fully invested in the characters. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's another great kind of bait and switch. That's a a beautiful trick to pull off. Well, and those plot changes and pacings are much more true to real life. Like in real life, things don't build like over the course of three acts to a big climax. And that's something that the 2005 Pride and Prejudice does is because it's so dramatic, it really builds that like three act structure pretty nicely. But here in this adaptation, and I think which is more true in the book, things just happen. Like a dinner party can just get interrupted, but it doesn't have to mean a big thing. I mean, what it does for the plot is it forces Emma and Mr. Eldon to have a confrontation in a carriage and it's very funny but you know it's just you think it's going to be this big dinner and then it just gets interrupted because that's what it's like in real life and I think that's why Austin's works are so great as well it's a really perfectly structured story and props to the screenwriter because a perfectly structured book almost never turns into a perfectly no, and, structured and yeah, movie. I mean, it's not like, this is not a one-to-one. I mean, I've, I've, I read the book once in school. Yeah. Um, and I remember liking it and I, you know, I remember it, but I'm not nearly as familiar with this story as I am with Pride and Prejudice. So mm-hmm. I don't remember how accurate this is, but it's certainly, I mean, that book's pretty long. It's one of Austin's longer books. Certainly there's stuff that's been cut out. It's only a two-hour movie. Props to the screenwriter for making it work so well. I only have one thing left to talk about. Sure. So that is the classic Jane Austen dance scene. Oh we God. get here when they throw a ball. I got to say, I mean, I love, again, Pride and Prejudice 2005 is the best movie of all time. <laughs> I will never back down from that. Yeah. The dance scene, you know, the dance scene with Ooh. Lizzie and Darcy is really good, but I like this one more, honestly. So this one, let me set the stage. This yeah. the, the classic Jane Austen dance scene is candlelight, classical kind of music, and mm-hmm. titanic sexual tension. Oh, my God. Did you notice that Mr. Knightley and Emma are the only characters who aren't wearing gloves in yes, this Yes, I read the IMDb trivia. Okay, I don't know. I didn't know if you read it. <laughs> don't outfox me. I also me. just noticed it while watching the movie. <laughs> Sorry, I pay attention. Yeah, no, I do anyway, I do my research afterwards. Sorry, go ahead. Continue. So, your... yeah, I, I have a thought here, and I kind of need a second to lay it out. Okay. So, what I took away from this scene, I mean, it's gorgeous to watch, but what, yeah. I, what I got from it this time, because I, I know this pretty well, well, I've seen it three times in two years. I feel like that's irregular for most people. Yeah, especially for you. Yeah. What this scene represents to me is a total shift 
in these characters' relationships. Because mm-hmm. Emma and Knightley, that is the central kind of odd couple yeah. friendships, or sort of strained, ironic friendship at mm-hmm. the heart of the movie. Mm-hmm. And in this scene, with no dialogue, it shifts into this like desperate, passionate love oh story <laughs> that neither of them can fully understand or process yet. Yeah. And I, I think that makes sense. Like, look at our conversation at the beginning of this, mm-hmm. talking about the visual just hustle they're mm-hmm. putting into every frame of this movie. Mm-hmm. This scene represents the film for me, ascending into that intricacy and beauty that's present in every shot. Mm-hmm. It feels like a trust fall. Mm-hmm. Like this this shift into a love story, which is what everyone's expecting in Jane Austen, in romantic comedies. In a, in a period in drama. In a period drama. Yeah, especially when you open with, I'm a matchmaker, hmm, when's she gonna right. get married, you know. To make that transition into it finally becoming a love story, to make that purely visual is a trust fall with the audience. Sure, especially when it's been such a dialogue heavy movie thus and far after that scene ends they go back to their normal relationship they yeah. fight they have other conversations well mr knightley does run into his house take off his yes and that's what i'm getting to lay down on the floor <laughs> so the moments of their love story after this scene mm-hmm. continue in silence mm-hmm. so knightley dropping yes. to the floor and lying down is oh. a totally silent solo scene mm-hmm. almost like the character study taxi driver thing we were talking about before sure yeah uh knightley walking up to the carriage mm-hmm. after the dance when mm-hmm. he like looks through the window and they have eye contact and oh! then they leave. Total silence. Almost as good as the hand flex scene. <laughs> and they also have a shared uh, glance and pause in the courtyard when he runs to her yes, house. Yes, because he gets there and then Harriet gets there and interrupts everything. Right, mm-hmm. right. Those three scenes are the silent, like let's move the love story forward scenes. Yeah. But in between that, they have this fight. And Mm -hmm. I think that's them engaging on that old friendship level, Mm -hmm. which is why they can talk to each other normally without that sort of awkwardness. They're shifting back to that old dynamic. Yeah. And when they resolve that fight and the conversation kind of continues, like you've gotten the sorries out of the way and you keep talking, then it starts getting strained and clipped again. Mm -hmm. And because they both know it's transitioning into like the elephant in the room now. Yeah. And it's even addressed in that scene. Emma says, if you wish to speak to me, she pauses and says, as a friend. Yeah. (laughs) I thought it was a great way of just kind of momentarily acknowledging that. I, I, yeah. I, they've done such a beautiful job on every technical level that I know everyone in the audience gets it. But mm-hmm. it's a great little nod to that. Yeah. And those two kind of shifting concurrent dynamics. I just, mm-hmm. I feel like every actor understood the script. And yeah. that is so rare in classic yeah. adaptations. Oh, for sure. There's, there's another sort of, maybe the only echo mm-hmm. I found in this movie connects to this idea. Mm. The romance between Harriet and Robert Martin mm. <laughs> Robert Martin does not have a single line of dialogue. No, he doesn't. And their relationship through the entire course of the movie uh-huh. is always a love story. Yeah. And it's totally silent. Mm. Just like what we get with Emma and Knightley once they evolve into That's loving really each cool. other. That's cool. I like that. Yeah. Well, and I think, ugh, I can't, I don't know why. I think the actor who's playing Mr. Robert Martin is also on Sex Education, mm-hmm. a show we've talked about before. We Fantastic absolutely adore. on Netflix. Yeah. That character, he's so special and sweet. Yeah, so he's he's acting in that part as well. And Harriet's like so sweet and confused and innocent and mm-hmm. just it's just so beautiful. But that's not what I want to talk about. I just every time they're on screen I go, Gah! Okay. But so um the scene with Mr. Knightley and Emma, when they finally like have that confrontation, he confesses his feelings, he proposes to her, she gets a nosebleed, it's all good. The reason that scene, one of the reasons that scene I think is so effective is because unlike The Pride and Prejudice 2005, the humor and absurdity in this movie and the like constant like quippiness and silliness, it makes the romantic scenes really stand out because there's yeah. not very much actual romance in this movie. And I mean that with a lowercase and uppercase R, where Whereas the Pride and Prejudice is full of it. It's <laughs> yeah. overflowing with it. Right. But here, and so you have to like really make those moments big. Like that's why Mr. Darcy has to propose in the rain instead right, of in right. a drawing room and stuff like that. But here, you know, I mean, they're outside in this beautiful meadow with this beautiful tree, mm-hmm. but it's still like that moment is full of humor and ridiculousness. And, you know, the tension is broken when she gets her nosebleed and they're like trying to figure out what to do about <laughs> Harriet because she's in love with Mr. Knightley. And they're like, well, we don't want that. What do we do about that? When they have those soft moments, you know, when they have the dance scene, yeah. when he runs into the living room and takes off his clothes, <laughs> when he tells her that he loves her, like those moments feel so big and so powerful. Mm-hmm. And I think 
that is more true to how the books feel compared mm. to the Pride and Prejudice adaptation yeah. like we're used to. Because as far as I remember, Jane Austen's books are not chock full of these beautiful romantic moments. Like there's the occasional beautiful line, but it's so occasional that it hits you really hard. And this movie captures that really well. And I, I do want to say that I think If I Loved You Less, I might be able to talk about it more is a better line than I love you most ardently. And sure. I love, 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 love you, whatever the hell. Right. Like th- this one is straight from the book and better. And it's less of that kind of period piece, capital R romance. Like it's it's more yes. everyday speak. It's more yes, colloquial. Yes, it's how a real person would say something. But the phrasing is still gorgeous. It kills me every yeah, yeah, single yeah. freaking time. It's profound, but with like cat in the hat language, which is kind of the most impressive type of dialogue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The last thing I want to talk about, I think, is just Emma as a character. Hmm. She's so unlikable. <laughs> and Jane Austen wanted to write a character that people didn't like. That was her goal. Sure. And I think this movie is so good at allowing us to not like her. Because I think other adaptations try to make her just, oh, she's just quirky and just not totally aware of how much she's actually wrecking everybody's lives. But <laughs> yeah. they're like, oh, it's okay. Like, she's just, you know, it's okay. Uh-huh. But this one, I mean, you immediately like her because Anya Taylor-Joy is doing a brilliant job. She's so charming. She's so charming. In everything. And she's funny. And you feel like that first scene, you know, she's walking into the greenhouse to clip yeah. the flowers. Her first line is like, not that one, to the servant <laughs> yeah, clipping yeah. the flowers. And then when she goes to talk to Miss Taylor, you can see she's genuinely upset that Miss Taylor is leaving. Yeah. But the way she's playing it is also in such a like, mm, why are you leaving? And it's just right, like, right. you kind of like, Ugh, okay. <laughs> and it's like that for the whole but thing. She but she looks like she's having so much fun. I know. And so it's- It's endearing, even it's, though it shouldn't be. <laughs> exactly. Like we're, we're meant to, to like her and, and, and recognize that mm-hmm. charm, but she's also really vain and like too clever and is very self-centered. And, and completely oblivious. Completely. And thinks so highly like, of herself. If you If you- Watch this, or if you watch it again, if you've already seen it, watch the those early scenes with Emma and Mr. Elton. Mm-hmm. She's fully interpreting it as him falling in love with Harriet. But she, he's so, like his gaze, he, he, he stares at Emma. He's so obviously into and Emma. And his gaze lingers on her the uh-huh. entire scene, like after she turns away. Uh, and it's very funny to not, because it would be so easy to make Emma be all vain. Oh, well, of course he loves me. But Emma's vanity is not in her own attractiveness. It's in her social power. That's what she's vain about. And Mr. Knightley even says that. That's why Mr. Knightley is so good. He's fantastic. He calls Emma out on her shit. Yes. And he helps us understand her, but also love her and sympathize with her because he also loves her and sympathizes with her. Right. He's like our translator for like social uh, standards of Mm -hmm. Regency England, like the scene with Miss Bates. He explains why what she did was so horrible. Because when you first see that scene, because she's in insulting Miss Bates you're Mm -hmm. like well yeah Miss Bates sucks you like agree with Emma even though you're like that was kind of rude but Mr. Knightley explains no it was incredibly rude because of all these complicated social reasons and And then you really understand it like he is communicating exposition or rules of the time there Mm -hmm. but it reads like such amazing compassion and empathy yes and it's always it always serves his character yes you see how how kind and good a person he is and mm. how honest he's willing to be with Emma and how he'll call her out on stuff yeah because he because no one else would say to Emma what he said which is like you should not have done that for x y and z reasons you really should feel bad and kind of how dare you but like no one else in that group would have said that Frank Churchill's kind of like Ooh, okay and uh-huh. Harriet of course is not going to say a single thing yeah and so just their their dynamic is so good and so special also I'm pretty sure he's the only character who on screen calls her Emma. Interesting. I mean, obviously her father would call her Emma, but we never see him do it. No. Harriet, I believe, always says Miss Woodhouse. Hmm. She maybe says Emma, but I don't remember. I can only remember Miss Woodhouse. Sure. Knightley almost exclusively calls her Emma. That's very interesting. Which for the time would not have been normal. It, right. It, unless, you, unless there's like a close intimacy, you wouldn't call a woman that you're not married to or related to by their first name. It kind of recontextualizes the title, though. Like making this thing from his perspective and her kind of living up to the version of her that like he knows she can be Mm -hmm. she just has to get over herself yes because the movie takes place over like the course of a year because it starts in autumn and goes all the way through summer you love those title cards Uh, for the seasons it's because of the the tapestry upon (laughs) which the title is placed but no it's so you see them at the beginning and Mm -hmm. how they they get along they're a little flirty they've got a good friendship but i mean he says like early on like you're way too vain and so she kind of improves 
improves upon herself and he becomes more caring and more open and more vulnerable with her and you see them like grow over the course of that year and there's man it's a really <laughs> good story it's a great movie i don't want to disappoint you but i should say in the book Hmm. knightley's a lot older than emma which is pretty normal for the time and also they grew up it's kind of hinted at in the movie they grew up together like pretty much like brother and sister and so there's a little bit of ickiness there and knightley says something to the effect of i've been in love with you since you were 13 but he was like (laughs) an adult so it's a little bit gross so just he was 35 (laughs) he was in his like early to mid 20s yeah so i don't like that gross. version as much i'm, I'm just, gonna here how I about want this you to read the book i just no, think it's better I'm if you know make, that going in how about we make the movie canon where everyone's of a, a correct age cam it's not nearly as bad as sense and sensibility when marianne is 17 and colonel brandon's like 37 <laughs> i mean the age difference is oh apparent boy. in the movie adaptation but it's even worse in yeah, the story not, in the book it, yeah so you know well what a note to end on <sighs> I just wanted to avoid that out. Sorry, Great movie. The book. No, Maybe but, dodge the book. <laughs> no, but I, I like that they basically made them the same age in the movie. Yes. It made more sense. But yeah. just, I think their relationship is one of my favorites. I mean, obviously Darcy and Elizabeth is great, but I've read some, uh, not criticism, books. but interpretation. <laughs> I've read some books. <laughs> I've read some interpretations and I kind of noticed this too. Emma and Darcy are almost, oh, Emma and Knightley are almost a Lizzie Darcy flip. Emma is the mm. Darcy and Knightley is the Lizzie because Emma, like Darcy, is like very prejudiced, thinks very highly of herself, messes up some really important relationships like um, Robert Martin and Harriet versus mm-hmm. Mr. Bingley and Jane. And then Knightley and uh, Lizzie are a bit more centered and grounded, um, right. but, but also still very opinionated, um, really loyal and protective. Anyway, so it's just an interesting um, yeah. flipping. Yeah, People cause... have called it like a gender bent Pride and Prejudice. I mean, it's not that direct. It's more complicated and I think that diminishes what the story is, but it's still interesting. Yeah, because like Pride and Prejudice, Darcy's the one screwing up mm-hmm. a lot. Mm-hmm. And here, Emma's the one screwing up a lot. <laughs> yes, but like in a completely different way because she's yeah, not yeah. awkward. She's incredibly social and very confident. I just meant like what drives the plot forward. No, right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's just about just miscommunication and social complexities. <laughs> it's a great pair of movies. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely watch both of those. Totally, because they're so different from each mm-hmm. other. And I think both of them are two extremes of beautiful elements of Jane Austen's books. And so watching them together, you kind of get the full scope of Austen. So I really yeah, like that. Yeah. I was going to talk about the costumes too, but I'll just say they're really good. And <laughs> they were nominated and for an Oscar. Highly historically accurate yeah. um, with a couple liberties, but like garments copied directly. But more importantly, they also look good. They look so good. Because there are a lot of, there's a lot of historical or scientific accuracy that is boring mm. as shit in movies. Yeah. They are so accurate. And like I've said before, the on here waistline <laughs> is ugly. It is yeah. not flat flattering for any woman no. unless they are pregnant like mm-hmm. eight months pregnant still this movie manages to make them so beautiful and says so much i mean emma's character is just expressed so beautifully through her costumes it for aesthetics alone watch this movie like <laughs> yeah. you can watch this movie like, sound off no subtitles i mean the, squinting but, but the music does so much too Kim. the yeah. music is the music is c- composed i great. forgot to say it's isabel waller bridge which is phoebe waller bridge's sister she wrote fleabag and stars mm-hmm. in it isabel is her sister much like pride and prejudice it completely cements you in the world and like the tone of the movie this, mm. the score is really really good yeah but anyway my point was even if you don't care to listen to the dialogue just watch the rest of the movie just to have a good time and enjoy it because it's great it's a great time it's a half-hearted recommendation i'm just saying it's good in all fronts yeah. so no matter what you're focusing on you're gonna have a good time